I always sort of felt a pull towards religion. I was always interested in it. Um, when we moved to the South, there was certainly a lot of um, Christian homes, a lot of friends of mine who went to church. And so I definitely knew about the gospel. I was interested in it, but I didn't really understand it. Um, and as I got older, I really started to question God and how he could send people to hell. That was sort of the big hang-up that I had with religion. I really humanized God. And I would say to people, you know, if I couldn't send even my biggest enemy, you know, to burn in hell for all eternity, how could a God who loves people so much do something like that? I would have called myself maybe spiritual. You know, I thought that all of the religions were right. Um, I kind of felt that there was a way for all of them to kind of overlap and work together. And um, as I met Russell, he was atheist, and, and I think that really helped to maintain even further away from Christianity. So before I got sick, um, I was somebody who probably spent most of their time worrying about how healthy my diet was. Russell and I had just been married for a year. We were happy. Um, I was focused on working out. Exercise was a big part of our relationship. I actually was able to do CrossFit all during my pregnancy. I was running when I went into labor. I felt like I had done everything right. Um, I had a career in pharmaceutical sales that was important to me. And then when I got sick, um, you know, everything changed. Today is your day for the miracle. Is it God's will to heal? If so, is it his will to heal me? The answer is yes and yes. When I'm praying for somebody, the first thing that has to happen is I have to be absolutely convinced that it's God's will to heal people every time. The Word of Faith movement is the term that's given to a movement that's more commonly known as the health and wealth gospel, the prosperity gospel, and even claim it gospel, this teaching that it is always God's will for a Christian to be wealthy, it's always God's will for a Christian to be physically healed, we should never be sick. Believe me when I tell you, I never get sick. I was as sick as a sick dog, with a, with a cold, yeah, yeah, I get sick too. Or if we do get sick, we can be healed as long as we have enough faith, we can attract positive things to ourselves through positive thinking. And Norman Vincent Peale, the great Norman Vincent Peale was my pastor. The power of positive thinking. And the Word of Faith movement is led by people such as Benny Hinn, world's most famous faith healer, Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, Joyce Meyer, Joel Osteen, Joseph Prince, T.D. Jakes, Andrew Womack. And these are just some of the more prominent leaders of the movement. Uh, but what has happened is that the United States of America has created this false theology and has now exported it to the rest of the world to the point that now the face of Christianity in most of the world today is word of faith. The idea, simply put, is that if you, if you love Jesus, if you're a follower of Christ, you can generally expect health, wealth, and happiness. When I went into labor, um, everything started to go wrong. Um, my delivery went really fast. Um, I found out later that it, that was because I had a connective tissue disease, and that's one of the signs of it. I was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos uh, syndrome, which is a really rare genetic disorder that affects the connective tissue and the collagen throughout your body. So it affects everyone in different ways, but it can affect uh, pretty much every body system. After the delivery, I was left with a fractured pelvis um, and a lot of internal injuries that caused me a lot of pain. And um, my doctor told me that right away I would need surgery to repair my pelvis. And I basically had two choices. We could have one more child or we could go ahead and, and have that surgery. We had always wanted to have um, four kids. That was sort of the number that we wanted. Um, but we had to change that. And we decided that we would have two. We still weren't going to church. We still didn't believe in God. Um, I still just kind of struggled my way through with our daughter until I could get pregnant with our son. When he was born early, um, in all honesty, I was just grateful that the pregnancy was over, that the pain was over, uh, and that I could move forward in scheduling that surgery that was going to give me my life back. I went into that thinking, this surgery will cure me. 
when this is over, I will get right back to my old life. Everything will be the same. I deserve to be healed. I deserve to have no pain. I deserve my old life back. I didn't do anything wrong. You know, God wants you healthy. I believe in healing and divine healing, of course, and I go to the world and travel and preach the gospel. And I, I grew up in the Word of Faith movement and the prosperity gospel. I worked for my uncle Benny Hinn, who's a famous faith healer and pretty well known. When I worked with my family, I was a catcher. And so my job was to look sharp in a suit and be on stage when people were being prayed for. Uh, but what was going through my mind at the time at every crusade was that this was real, that people were really being touched, that my uncle was anointed. I would lift my hands and I would speak in tongues and I would pray in the spirit praying that God would touch them, that he would fill them, that he would heal them, etc. And to Jesus be the praise. Today, I hold no positions that are in agreement with my family, the word of faith theology, or the prosperity gospel. And the reason for that is I've come to an understanding of the true gospel. I didn't grow up in a believing household. Great-grandmother, grandmother, uncle, mom. Uh, all drug addicts, father a drug addict, drug dealer. When I was about 12, I started using drugs and getting involved with gangs and violence and drug dealing. And, and then when I was 18, the Lord saved me. And basically, man, I was preaching the gospel in, in the same projects where I used to sell dope. And I met a guy and he said, do you understand that Bible you're carrying around? And I told him that I didn't and that nobody had taking the time to help me understand it, and he pulled me aside and said that he would. And I had no idea that what he was teaching me was a prosperity gospel. I actually grew up with no background in church. When I fell into the Word of Faith prosperity churches, I thought that that was the truth, and so I fully depended on my pastor for feeding that to me. I guess I just had this knowledge that God existed, but I didn't have an understanding of who God was. I had no clue what the gospel was. I had never really heard it. As far as I knew, he died and rose again so that I could have a prosperous life. You know, Jesus died that we might live an abundant life. And so that's what it was. Thanks. Thanks for my ticket, you know, so. I was the benefactor of the theology that we taught, which primarily makes Jesus your magic genie in a sense. And if you rub him right, if you do all the right things, he will bless you. You will have everything you want. I view the Holy Spirit like the genie from Aladdin. I had a totally false understanding of God. And so when God didn't do what I felt that he was supposed to do, I was very upset with him. I was very upset. By the time I was finishing high school, all I really wanted to do was play baseball. Naturally, being a Word of Faith kid, for me, if you really want God to bless you, you've got to do something for him. And so I sowed a seed before ever going to college, after graduating high school. And my seed that was sown was working for Uncle Benny. I was going to serve the holy man. I was going to be on his ministry team. I was going to put God first because I've got dreams. I've got money I want to make. I've got houses I want to buy. i got baseball that I want to play. And what you do is you create a God who only wants to give you all the desires of your heart. God. Almighty is about to give you the desires of your heart. The true gospel says when well, no, those desires that we're born with, that those aren't good desires at all, that our hearts are corrupt, our hearts are desperately deceitful and wicked. Fast forward to about my second to last year of college, and I've got a coach who is a disciple-making coach. He's a wonderful man. His main goal was to develop us as men and as Christian men. And so one day before a game, he stands there and says, Gentlemen, God is sovereign. Don't worry about the scouts in the stands. Don't worry about all that you know, the future holds. God is sovereign. And then he quotes a famous proverb that says, A uh, king's heart is like water in the channels of the hand of the Lord. He turns them wherever he wishes. He says, God controls kings. God controls your future. God controls the scouts. He's sovereign. Don't worry about it. And as a word of faith prosperity kid, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, Mm, how do I get on the good side of sovereignty? I need the sovereignty thing to go to work for me. But that was a massive seed that was planted in my life because it was the opposite of everything I had ever been taught. Because you've been taught things like God's in control. The Bible doesn't teach that. But it was completely biblical. God was sovereign, and nothing I say or do 
was going to change that. The prosperity gospel is really the worst manifestation of what some might call the seeker sensitive movement or the attractional church movement. And you have to be careful about this because the church should be attractive. But we have to ask, why is it attractive and to whom is it attractive? The church should be attractive because God's people have a hunger and a thirst and a desire for his word being taught and preached. And that is a profoundly attractive experience and a profoundly attractive thing for someone who is converted, who God has changed their heart and they desire those things. But the attractional church in the negative sense are those churches that seek to make worship and make participation in the church attractive to the unconverted heart, to the non-believer. So therefore, the sermon becomes less about opening up God's word and letting it breathe, and more about entertaining that audience. So they can present messages which downplay uncomfortable parts of the truth. It can simply be a God is love message where you're careful not to define God very biblically or love very biblically. Make it sound like there's a force that approves of whatever you in your innermost being want. Well, that's nothing like God. That's actually a lot more like Satan. There's an assumption that unbelievers are seeking after God, when in reality, they're seeking after a God of their own choosing. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 is really, really clear that there would be a group of people who wanting to have their ears tickled would accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. The real Jesus comes and he says, I don't want to give you the desires of your heart. I want to reorient the desires of your heart. Uh, the prosperity gospel appeals to two of the most basic and universal of all human desires, to be wealthy and never to be sick. Nobody wants to die. Nobody wants to be sick. And nobody wants to be poor. All the things that Jesus says, we have to be willing to set aside to follow him. They take all of those things and they make that the attraction of the gospel. I don't know what you feel about the prosperity gospel, the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel, but I'll tell you what I feel about it, hatred. I'm all alone, no friends, no fellowship, no church, and I click on this video, and there's this old man with gray hair, and he is preaching like I've never heard anybody preach before, handling the word of God in a way that I've never seen. And I love it, and I just want more of it. And so I continue to watch video after video after video. And finally, I come to a sermon jam. And being exported from this country to Africa and Asia, selling a bill of goods to the poorest of the poor. Believe this message. Your pigs won't die. Your wife won't have miscarriages. You have rings on your fingers and coats on your back. That's coming out of America. He begins to talk about this crap called gospel. People that ought to be giving our money and our time and our lives instead selling them a bunch of crap called gospel. And here's the reason it is so horrible. When was the last time that any American, African, Asian ever said, Jesus is all satisfying because you drove a BMW? Never. And I just thought, this guy doesn't know anything. I thought this guy was a man. This guy doesn't know anything. He's an idiot. They'll say, Jesus can do that? Yeah. Well, I'll take Jesus. That's idolatry. That's not the gospel. The Jesus who's going to help me pay my taxes at the end of the year, the Jesus who's going to correct my wife's genetic disorder, I'll take that Jesus. That Jesus sounds great. But what that is is idolatry. It's an elevation of the gift above the giver. The prosperity gospel is exactly like marrying someone for their money. Are you coming to God for God? Or are you coming to God so that you can ultimately get what your heart's truly after and that's something else? My wife married me when I was dirt poor. We were living in a cockroach infested apartment. I know she loves me for me, man. It only had to go uphill from there. The Bible's not against wealth. It's not against happiness. It's really how do we view those things? It is true that God does want us to be happy. But that happiness is not the way the 21st century American culture would define happiness. If you're talking to someone who's already achieved success, they've had the cars, uh, the beautiful wife, the children, they can have everything that the world says you should have to be happy, and yet there's something missing. 
I was very successful in the business world. I began as a rocket scientist down in Cape Kennedy, Florida. Later on, I was recruited to a computer firm in Dallas. Everything I touched turned to gold. Everything that I had desired and that, that I acquired, it had an ending to it. Even when I bought my first uh, real expensive sports car, it wore off. I was thinking of the next car. And really, there was an emptiness inside of me in spite of everything that I had accumulated. And so when I met Jesus Christ, I found something that wouldn't end. The ultimate gift of the gospel is not all of these other things. It, it's God himself. God is both the giver and the gift. And I think this is what happens in our pulpit Sunday after Sunday. Christ is hidden from the American gospel. And essentially, I think that is the problem. Because the gospel is not a plan. It's a person. The call of the gospel is a call to follow Christ. And Christ made that call. He said, follow me. Paul makes the call in the same way, saying, we preach Christ and him crucified. The center of the message of both Jesus and Paul was Christ himself, Christ his work, and the response that says, I will submit, I will follow after Christ. It is a living, vibrant relationship with a person that literally transforms your life. One of the misconceptions that we have is thinking that salvation is the gospel when really salvation is the result of the gospel. And so the good news of the gospel is not only do you escape eternal judgment, that's a fringe benefit. You get to be restored to God. You get to know God as a person. You get to fall in love with him and experience his love for you. And that is what satisfies the heart. And then the most beautiful message and truth of the gospel is that through Jesus, we get God. Through Jesus, we get to be satisfied in him. But I was a true sheep. I had really been converted. And I loved God and I loved his word. And I was just confused. And the only thing I knew was, whatever this guy is doing with the Bible, I want more of that. So I decided to just kind of avoid his other stuff about the prosperity gospel. But eventually, uh, I couldn't avoid it. Once I became more grounded in the scriptures and began to see the truth and beauty of the biblical gospel, the prosperity gospel, I had to bow the knee. I fell into a discipleship course at my old church. The curriculum was by a third party organization. And that's where I first heard the gospel. And from that program, I began to realize that my church wasn't teaching the gospel, wasn't preaching the gospel at all. And it was also a prosperity word of faith church and so soon after that I left that church people always ask me how I first became interested in this subject matter this movement and it goes back to when I was a teenager I was born with cerebral palsy and as a teenager when I was 16 years old a neighbor of mine came up to me and he said Justin God has spoken to me and he's told me that he's going to heal you as long as you have enough faith and at age 16, this is something that really resonated with me because I wanted to be able to do the things that my friends were doing. I wanted to be able to run and to play football and, and all these things that I thought were so important at that age. And he told me about a faith healer named Nora Lamb who was coming to my then hometown of Vicksburg, Mississippi. And a long story short, went to this meeting and obviously I was not healed. Mrs. Lamb saw us coming, and all of a sudden she decided it was time for her to go, and so she tried to make her exit, and my father saw what was happening, and so he briskly walked up to her and stopped her, and so this was in front of everyone, and Mrs. Lamb pretty much had to turn around. She came back, and she dipped her finger in that oil. She touched me on the head, and I actually fell backwards. Now, looking back on that, I know now that there was nothing spiritual about that at all. It's just that we had seen everyone else do it. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right, baby. It's all right. And so subconsciously, when you're predisposed to this and you've seen everyone else do it, you do the same thing. It's just a matter of psychosomatic uh, phenomena. It's mind over body. But then she turned to my father and she said, what is your financial situation? And my dad said, well, what does that have to do with anything? And she said, the more money you give to the Lord's work, 
the more likely it is he will answer your prayers. When I let go of something in my hands, I'm talking about your money. God always lets go of something in his hand. Click on that donation button, and when you do, to sow $1,144. The reason why people teach that it's always God's will to heal, and if he doesn't, the problem is them, is because that's a good way to manipulate people. Prosperity theology means money. Jesus is the banker. Jesus said, lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. We took our little magic religious pencil and put it right in there, and you can't touch it till you get here. You have treasure in heaven? He didn't say you couldn't get it out. Second Peter 2, Peter says it flat out. In their greed, they, meaning false teachers, will exploit you. Let's receive our evening offering this evening and uh, give you a chance to raise your income. He said, we don't give to get something back. Oh, yes, we do. <laughs> the God we worship had no place to rest his head. You think Jesus Christ would roll around in a Rolls Royce? Uh, I think he would have. He <laughs> rode around in a donkey that no man ever rode. <laughs> but the preachers that are preaching in our pulpits are asking for $100 million for an airplane. I really believe that if Jesus was physically on the earth today, he wouldn't be riding a donkey. If I want to believe God for a $65 million plane, you cannot stop me. Most, if not all, of my favorite pastors were false teachers. I cannot stomach a sermon by Joel Osteen or T.D. Jakes now. I have a visceral reaction. Well, Joel, what about their false doctrine? What about your false doctrine? Nobody is correct 100%. And it's funny because I used to just love them. I would listen to Joel Osteen on the way to work, you know, put my earphones in, and it just brightened my day. One of the, the quickest ways to spot a counterfeit gospel is to ask the question, who is this gospel about? Is this gospel, is this good news primarily about you and your personal happiness? I am happy. I am prosperous. You'll hear a lot of phrases like breakthrough, sow a seed to reap a harvest. Your destiny is on the horizon. Uh, God called you to be greater. It's your Stephen walking your purpose. Where's your best life now? Or is this a message about God? Yet Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. I am blessed. He became a curse. Joe Osteen, in his book, It's Your Time, he says this. He says, when you're in difficult times, it's good to remind God what you've done. God, I've kept my family in church. God, I've gone the extra mile to help others. I've given. I serve. I've been faithful. In your own time of need, you should call in all these seeds you've sown. So it's a softer, kinder, gentler version of salvation by works. It kind of turns the table on, on true Christian service, right? Because we would say true Christian service is supposed to be in reaction to what God has done for us, right? in service to him, out of a desire to glorify him. Whereas it seems that Joel was saying that we got to serve God in order to get more credit from God, in order then to have the ability to force God to serve us, you know, or to call him favors, as he says. God has you right now on the edge of a blessing, but there's a catch. It's still the law, not the gospel. The blessing will follow obedience. That's still law. Do this and you shall live. Do you have to obey? And as you obey, God will do it and trigger that possibility. Or do this and you shall live better. It's not do this and you shall live as in not going to hell. It's do this and you'll have a happier life. People criticize me because I want people to leave church feeling better than they were before. Joel Austin is more about, yeah, we don't need to talk about sin and, you know, hell or the wrath of God or anything like that. You know, let's talk about how we live this Christian life. What I would teach would just be more how to live a, a great life. And therefore, the gospel isn't about a rescue operation from heaven. Rather, it's just kind of trivialized as empowering us to have a better life, to become a better you. Whereas the good news is, God saves me because I can't attain my best life now. God saves me because no matter how hard I work at becoming a better me, I can't pull it off. 